Jebda 5 of uh, Six Siglas, I think, tape. I don't think that it is a book, but I actually don't know. Anyway, Jebda 5 is, and I'm not going to be distracted by my motherfucking phone. Um, or do I want to go something, a kind, well, you know what? We're not going to do this, but we are rather going to go through something related to stoicism. I, I don't actually know why, but I feel like I just rather want to go through something stoicism related. I don't know. Let's see. You know, if we can find a cool article, if we can find something that's amazing. Um, but I still really do have a problem with the Daily Stoic site. Maybe I do have to make it bigger. I'm very sorry if you can't see anything right now. Uh, email archives, interviews, profiles, wisdom, misc, archive. What if I just choose this one? Does this make sense then? Yes, it does. It actually does. So, Memento Mori, COVID-19 teaches us that death is closer than you think. Well, it is. Who is Diotimus? An introduction to the man who made an ex extraordinary mistake. Diotimus. I think that I've not gone through this one. I mean, we are going to see. And even if I've gone through it, then uh, there's actually way more people. Well, let's actually see. So, who is a Diotimus, an introduction to the man who made an extraordinary mistake. Introduction, yeah. Of the ancient stories, we know the least about Diotimus. He lived sometimes around the early 1st century BC, and he might have known the brilliant polymath Posidonius. That is about it. That is about all we learn from the sources that are typically rich with details and stories in the lives of the Stoics. When or where Diotimus was born, when or how he died, when or how he was introduced to the philosophy, who his students were, what he taught them, we don't know. But the reason we don't know much about Diotimus paradoxically tells us a great deal. The single story we have from the life of Diotimus is one, of, is one that has baffled historians and students of Stoicism for more than 2000 years. Which brings us immediately to what we can learn from the life of the Stoic. Lessons and exercises. Revenge is a dish best not served. Sometime around the turn, sometime around the turn of the first century BC, Diotimus committed what can only be described as an act of indispute, indisputable malice. He forged dozens and dozens of licentious letters uh, that framed the rival philosopher Epicurus, who was enjoying a resurgence in Athens amid the rising splendor and power of Rome. Diotimus portrayed Epicurus as some kind of depraved maniac, <laughs> a reputation that Epicurus has struggled to completely shed, shed even to this day, in order to bolster his argument against the philosophy. The Epicurean school at this time was under the leadership of Apollodorus, who we are told by Diogenes Lartius, smad Chrysippus, claiming that the Stoic had filled his books with quotes he had stolen from others. Such def formation of the great stoic we imagine Diodimus decided could not go unaddressed. Diodimus avenged slander with slander, committing a crime for far worse than what Apollodorus was falsely alleging against Chrysippus. We don't... <laughs> Chrysippus... It's actually Chrysippus. We don't know exactly what happened to Diodimus next, unfortunately, or how his story ended. It would be then Diodimus' sole contribution to the history of stoicism, making himself a cautionary tale. Seneca, who writes expansively on all sorts of philosophers and their behaviors and about the Epicureans more than 80 times across his surviving works, never once mentioned this incident and the sad failing of his own school. He did, however, write plenty about how the Stoic is supposed to be beyond grudges, beyond revenge, beyond petty competition or the need to win arguments. How much better to heal than uh, seek revenge from injury, Seneca wrote. Vengeance, and this is something that we went through very recently, wastes a lot of time and exposes you to many more injuries than the first that sparked it. Anger always at last hurt, best to take the opposite course. Would anyone think it normal to return a kick to a mule or a bite to a dog? Marcus Aurelius agreed, the best revenge is not to be like that. I think is definitely the case, and a very good point. Nothing is durable. Diodimus proved not only that the Stoics were hardly perfect and that no matter how much training or reading we have done, but also that a snap decision made in the moment can undo all of it. 
It was Seneca who said that building anything, whether a reputation or an empire, is a long process, but its undoing can be instant. The growth, and this is a quote, of things is a tardy process and their undoing is a rapid matter, he wrote. Nothing is durable. We should be anticipating not merely all that commonly happens by all that is conceivable, capable of happening. He could not have captured the, fol the folly of Theodemus better, nor could Shakespeare's funeral oration of Caesar be any more apt. Or in that play, the once stoic Brutus single deed, the assassination of uh, Julius Caesar, would come to overwhelm and obscure everything else the man would do in his life. And so it went for Diodemus, a philosopher who may well have had many interesting and profound things to say about the pursuit of moral perfection and well-being, but instead is known to us only for his one evil and vengeful decision to attempt to destroy the reputation of the founder of the rival school. Ask this question. If only Diodemus, before he acted in re uh, retaliation against Apollodorus, could have heard this line from Anthony de Mello. The question to ask is not what's wrong with this person, but what does this irritation tell me about myself? This question, this pause and then... Uh, this pause and then reversal is an essential element of Stoicism. It goes back to Epictetus, who said that we are complicit in the offense any time someone hurts our feelings or makes us upset. We are choosing to react to something. We have to remember that. We have to remember that we have the power, not them, that it is not the things they do that upset or offend us, but our judgment about, judgment about these things. The irritant is never the other person. It is always something within us. So... When you invitably get frustrated with someone today, remember to ask, what does this irritation tell me about myself? P.S. The best-selling author of The Daily Stoic, Ryan Holiday, and Stephen Hanselman have teamed up again in their new book, Lives of the Stoics, The Art of Living from Seno to Marcus. Along with presenting the fascinating lives of all the well-known and not so well-known Stoics, Lives of the Stoic distills a timeless and immediately applicable lessons about happiness, Success, Resilience, and Virtue. The book is available for pre-order and is set to release on September the 29th. I didn't know about that, but I think it is amazing. What if I press this link? Am I gonna be Amazon? Just don't want you to see my fucking address and stuff. But yeah, indeed. Yeah, indeed. That's fucking amazing. The Art of Living from Seno to Marcus Aurelius. Best-selling authors of the Daily Stoic. I see. Lives of the Stoics. Really amazing, actually. Is there some sort of a description there? Something? Um, not really. Not really. Um, where have I left? Probably somewhere like there? Or something? Oh god, I don't know. Or has it just opened another tab? This could also... Yeah, for sure. I know for sure it can't open another tab. But kind of... Uh, anyway. Uh, but there's actually also other people that... Uh, who is Posidonius, the most academic Stoic? Might... Well, who is Panathius, spreading Stoicism from Greece to Rome? Who is uh, Pocanius Agrippinus, an introduction to the Red Threat contrarian? Who is Portia Cato, an introduction to the Stoic superwoman? Gaius Rupelius Plautus. Uh, who is Publius Rutilius Rufus? Who could not be corrupted. Let's actually go through the superwoman. I do hope, do I have enough time? Well, let's see how long the article is. Because I don't want to half-ass something there. Ah, I should be fine. You know, let's just take it. Who is Portia Cato? An introduction to the Stoic superwoman. Uh, Porcia Catonis or Porcia of Cato was the daughter of the renowned Roman Stoic philosopher Cato the Younger, or Cato, or whatever. An enemy of the dictator Julius Caesar and his first wife, Attilia. She was known for her beauty and bold personality, as well as for her marriage, her second to Marcus Junius Brutus, who famously took part in the assassination of Julius Caesar. 
Uh, she was born between 73 BCE and 64 BCE and died by either suicide or illness around 42 BCE. Accounts of her possible suicide claim uh, she killed herself by swallowing hot coals, but overall the circumstances of her death are still disputed. Porcha of Cato was written about by Plutarch, a Greek essayist and biographer who later became a Roman citizen and others, and has been portrayed many times in popular culture, such as in Shakespeare's play Julius Caesar, in books like The, uh, the Eyes of March, and in TV and movies adapting Shakespeare's work. Much of her life was only documented in relation to Cato and Brutus, but within those accounts we can gather that she was a daring and interesting woman that continues to fascinate historians and writers alike. First, marriage. Marriage during Porch's time was quite a different arrangement uh, than it is in the modern days. Marriage were rarely for love, but more for practical purposes, such as political gain, or for children and fathers, were often the ones who married off the daughters or approved of their daughters' marriages. While Roman marriages were monogamous institutions, uh, divorcing and remarrying were common occurrences, a man could and would ask for the hands of women, even while either or both parties were still married. After divorce or death of a spouse, women were expected to remarry quickly, particularly those in the upper classes. Peter the Younger, who beyond being a Stoic philosopher, was a prominent Roman uh, public figure and senator, married Porcia to one of his political allies, Marcus Calpurinius. Bibulus, uh, while well, she was only a young teenager. It's reported that Porcia and Bobilius had a son together, Lucius, but this has been disputed as considering Lucius and Porcia's ages, she was likely to have been too young to have birthed him. Lucius was more likely from Bibulius' previous marriage. While there is not much mention of Porcia's feelings towards Bobilius, he declared he was in love with her. So when Quintus Hortensius, an orator and man four times older than Porcia, wanted to become Cato's ally and asked to marry Porcia, he refused. Hortensius argued saying that it was selfish for Bibulus to keep Porcia and her child bearing to himself and that Hortensius could always return Porcia to Bibulus after she was done giving him children. This was not a rare proposal in Rome at the time. Women of childbearing age would often divorce and remarry in order to give multiple powerful men years, and sometimes would return to previous partners after they had done so. Bibulus still refused, and Caterus supported Bibulus' refusal part, uh, partially because he didn't want Portia to marry someone quadruple her age. But it seems Cato still wanted uh, Hortensius' allyship because he divorced his second wife and allowed Hortensius to marry her instead. Cato later remarried his second wife after Hortensius died. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> During Porta's marriage, Julius Caesar's Gallic wars raged. Cato despised Caesar and opposed him in the Roman Senate. Caesar was defeated, but after the wars ended, he refused to return to Rome to face punishment. Cato disliked this to say, the least, and in 49 BCE he declared war, which became the Great Roman Civil War. Cato and Bibulus joined with Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, a Roman general well known as Pompey to, Pompey to oppose Caesar. In 48 BCE, after Pompey's defeat, uh, Bibulus died and Portia was win widowed. Her father, Cato the Younger, committed suicide after he was defeated in battle in 46 BC. Second marriage. Porcia's second marriage was her most famous and part of why she was a noted historical figure. It was to Marcus Junius Brutus, her first, her first cousin, who had fought against Caesar with Pompey and was later one of Julius Caesar's assassins. After Bibulus died and Porcia was widowed, Brutus divorced his wife Claudia Pulcra. Uh, while divorce and remarrying were common, they were often done after discussion with family and friends, with explanations as to why the marriage failed. However, Brutus divorced Claudia suddenly and without explaining his reasoning. The divorce was ill-received because there were no apparent problems, they had been married a long while and because Claudia was particularly well regarded. In fact, Brutus' own mother was against the divorce. In spite of this, Brutus married Portia and the marriage had a similar device reputation. Brutus' mother um, envied Brutus' love for Portia and supported his ex-wife over her, but many supporters of Pompey and Cato, like Cicero, 
a renowned Roman statesman and auditor, approved of the union. By all accounts, the marriage appeared to be a loving and loyal one. Portia and Brutus had one son, who unfortunately passed away in 43 BC. But what makes Portia and Brutus' marriage particularly interesting is how it was inextric inextricably entangled with Brutus' opposition to Caesar. Well, it's actually quite something to read there, I'm not gonna lie. Evolvement with the assassination of Julius Caesar. While it's unclear how much Portia knew about the plot to assassinate Julius Caesar, there are stories surrounding her possible involvement or knowledge through Brutus. One story says that one night Brutus was clearly troubled, while unbeknownst to Portia he was plotting the assassination. Portia, concerned, inquired what he was thinking about, he did not tell her. Portia reportedly um, suspected that was what was going on, but believed he would not tell her because he thought that, as a woman, she might, even if she didn't want to, spill secrets if tortured. So to prove herself, she clandestinely strapped her tight with a knife and left it untreated for at least a day. She endured symptoms such as a fever, chills and pain. She worked through the pain, then went to Prudus to show her wound and her loyalty, saying, You, my husband, though you trusted me, my spirit that it would not that would not betray you, nevertheless were distrustful of my body and your feelings was but human. But I found that my body also can keep silence, therefore fear not, but tell me all you are concealing from me, for neither fire nor lashes nor goats will force me to divulge a word. I was not born to that extend a woman, hence if you still distrust me, it is better for me to die than to live, otherwise let no one think me longer uh, longer the daughter of Cato or your wife. What? Brutus, upon seeing the wound, wound and hearing the struggles, was moved by Portia's ded dedication and vowed not to keep any more secrets. He reportedly said he hoped to act more deserving of her as her husband and had renewed vigor in his plot against Julius Caesar. What happened next is uncertain. Brutus clearly intended to tell Portia all about the upcoming assassination, if she wasn't actually in fact one of the co-conspirators as some stories say. But it is possible he didn't have an opportunity to do so before the mission was underway. Brutus and the other assassins pursued Caesar. The day of the assassination, Portia feared for Brutus' safety, sending letters asking about him and suffered severe anxiety, even fainted or even fainting. After murdering Caesar, Brutus and the others who took part traveled quickly to Athens. Portia was asked and agreed to remain in Rome. Both she and Brutus grieved the separation but believed it was for the best as Brutus was now in dangerous position. The marriage ended only in death, though we'll go over the disputed details of that later and seemed to be a strong one with love from both sides. Brutus once said fondly of Portia, Though the natural weakness of her body hinders her from doing what only the strength of man can perform, she has a mind as valiant and as active for the good of her country as the best of us. Death Portia's time and cause of death have been the subject of much debate. We don't know, uh, we do know she died while Brutus was away. One of the possible times was during the first battle of Philippi. According to this version, Portia had heard Brutus had died in battle and she killed herself, but Brutus was in fact still alive. In another version, she had heard Brutus died after the second battle of Philippi, which was true this time and killed herself then. The possible causes of her death vary, but the most popular story about her death is that, aggrieved by Brutus' alleged or real passing after battle, she killed herself by swallowing hot coals. Some agree she did commit suicide but claimed that she more likely did it by burning a coal in a closed off room and ultimately succumbed to carbon monoxide poisoning. Which by the way, I don't know, I I think it is kind of the best thing you can be doing, you know, as dumb as it may sound, but yeah. But other historians argue that she likely actually passed away from illness and that she died before Brutus did. Letters between Brutus and others points to a Porch's death being before Brutus and uh, these letters suggest it was from sickness. In one letter Brutus grieving, uh, grieves Porter's death and blames others for not taking care of her well enough. But in an earlier letter Brutus thanks people for taking care of Porter while she was sick, which suggests she's been sick for a while and perhaps finally died from it while Brutus was gone. Some question if these letters are genuine or if they are sufficient evidence one way or the other. 
Although the exact nature and timing of Portia's death is debated, the story of her greeting Brutus and swallowing coal in order to kill herself is the most often portrayed in popular culture, likely due to its dramatic nature. Yeah, of course, you know, we like drama. But anyway, key lessons from Portia K2. Although sources report that Portia of K2 loved philosophy, unsurprising considering she was raised by a prominent philosopher, which uh, philosophy she adhered to has not been thoroughly documented. However, some of her actions suggest she at least learns the stoic perspective and to give us lessons to draw from today. So there is two lessons we have. The first one is practice hardship. When Portia plunged a knife into her thigh or thigh and suffered, she was showing Brutus and herself that she could withstand terrible circumstances in order to stand by a cause she believed in. Cato himself, despite being afforded luxuries, would practice hardship. He wore haggard clothing, ate meager food and more to show himself he could still thrive even if his circumstances changed. We are not suggesting you wound yourself to demonstrate that you can withstand torture, uh, but even practice simple living, striping yourself of luxury to remind yourself you can live a good life without all the conveniences you uh, you have built into your everyday circumstances can aid you if uh, fortune takes away what is given you. Try camping with a tent and a sleeping bag, cook your own food, build a fire. You prefer to live in a house with central heating and a bed, but you can remind yourself you can manage with less. Because we really indeed can. Love fearlessly. Porter's marriage to Brutus, to say the least, was difficult due to external factors. They immediately endured gossip surrounding their marriage. Her mother-in-law favored Brutus' ex-wife and her husband and perhaps she herself were fighting for a dangerous but worthy cause. You probably shouldn't marry your first cousin or get involved with a high-profile assassination, but the lesson here is that Portia and Brutus weathered storms together because they loved and dedicated themselves to each other despite what was thrown at them. Overall, Portia of Cato was a respected and fascinating woman in her time and continues to intrude historians and artists alike to this day. Yeah, amazing thing, really amazing thing. And yeah, with that being said, this is going to be the end of the episode. Thank you very much for listening and or watching. And yeah, I wish you the best health of happiness and all success. And also hope that you're going to remind yourself and you're going to be remembered, which basically means your legacy and basically means just being a nice person. And then also being remembered as a nice person, which is a pretty fucking cool thing. Three other questions that I have you are, why are you here? What are you trying to change? And what is bothering you the most? These three questions are hopefully going to show you your purpose and maybe even a business idea, which is fucking cool. One last thing that I want to give you is what could you essentially say to another person that is indeed going to change their life. Because I totally believe from the bottom of my heart that we all can say something. We all can communicate something that is indeed, you know, and or in fact going to change somebody's life. We all can. You and me, the guy next to you, you know, we all can. And with that being said, please stay healthy and safe. And I do also hope that your family and loved ones and buddies and whatnot are all safe and healthy. And yeah, going to see you the next time. So, bye-bye.